Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. Okay, before we get started, three quick things. First of all, this video was brought to you by all my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. Two, this video is also brought to you by Boxu because I still love this product and they still want to sponsor me. And three, after this upload, this channel is going to be going on a bit of a break up until October 1st. I've been going non-stop for years and years and years with this channel and I just kind of want to take a little break to breathe and think and maybe rework some things. But that doesn't mean I'm not getting stuff done. I'm still going to be streaming every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time over on Twitch. I will still be making videos for my second channel, Gaija Perspective, and I will finally be able to start making a few more D&D yokai races because it has been way too long since I've been able to make one. So give me just a couple of weeks or so, and I promise I'll be back fresh with brand new Witch Ninja, Yokai Hunters, and Culture Shock. Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. <gasps> All right, Witch Ninja and Snake Eyes is done. Freaking finally. 30 minutes of analysis on that point. It's finally done. And we're right back to Ghost of Tsushima for what, the fourth time? Crazy the shelf life of this game. What? You realize as of writing, we literally went through the same song and dance exactly a year ago, right? Oh, right. Witch Ninja Zuko was done. Freaking finally. 34 minutes of analysis on that boy, and it's finally done. And we're right back to Ghost of Tsushima. Huh. Well, hey, don't look at me. The last poll was another one-sided landslide with folks really wanting a cultural breakdown of Ghost of Tsushima's first single-player DLC, Iki Island. And, yeah, if it were up to me, I would agree. I mean, it's my personal game of the year for 2020, and it's continuing to show off just how insanely good it is in this DLC. Not just because of what it does technically or narratively, but because of just how much additional culture and history Sucker Punch has capitalized on to retell the Mongol invasion of 1274, and how it utterly rocked Iki Island. Also, yes, absolute spoilers by the way, go stick your head in a basket if you haven't played the DLC for yourself yet. Really? Cause I don't recall any Mongol shaman cells trying to convert the populace during the 1274 invasion. While the game's heart revolves around our lead, Jin Sakai, making peace with the loss of his father, as well as righting the wrongs his father had done to the people of Iki, the actual plot of the DLC revolves around the Eagle, who's been going from village to village on Iki Island and forcing the population to take a psychedelic poison that will inevitably kill them unless they join the Eagle and the Mongols. This very thing happens to Jin himself in what I can only say is one of the best bait-and-switch moments in the entire game. See, you think you're gonna have another showdown to take your father's old fort back, but... FIGHT! Jin's dragged in front of the eagle in bindings, who then forces her mind-twisting concoction onto him, causing Jin no end of hallucinations that are triggered over, and over, and over again throughout this story. Coming to a head when he discovers that, unless he becomes the eagle's next great shaman, the hallucinations and madness will eventually break and kill him. I know that Ghost of Tsushima takes a decent number of liberties when it comes to its use of history, but... How factual is all that? You wanna know what's nuts? It's insanely factual. Now, I'm not the most knowledgeable when it comes to Mongolian culture. Japanese culture, after all, is my specialty. But through a few websites like AsianSociety.org, Britannica.com, and a social science research article from China on the Horchin Shaman, I can safely say that Sucker Punch, by and large, took this idea right from centuries-old Mongolian traditions. You say, by and large, what do you mean? Well, here's the thing about shamanism in Mongolian culture. It wasn't a profession you could just go interview for. Shaman were hand-selected by the spirits themselves. Based on everything that I researched, the process of someone becoming a shaman, known as the touch of the spirit, starts with what's casually called shaman disease, a phenomena where an individual would be suddenly stricken with some sort of mental or sensory deficiency. Things like hallucinations, hysterics, constantly fading, and similar major illnesses or typical symptoms and these symptoms could last anywhere from days to years. When anyone in the community becomes ill, it's typical that a shaman would be summoned to assess the issue. But in cases like this, the shaman may claim that the afflicted individual is being called by the spirits to become a shaman. At this point, the individual has two options. Either answer the call of the spirits or continue to suffer shaman disease until death. Not so much of an option, huh? Well, should the individual answer the call, and most did, the shaman would help the person go into the quote, long sleep, a time where the candidate would be spiritually inspected and dissected by the natural powers to determine whether or not this person is true shaman material. If the spirits deem the individual a good shaman candidate, he or she awakens to the life of a shaman initiate, learning all the songs, dances, and supernatural responsibilities that they will shoulder. 
From there, they're given a carved staff, usually with a horse head on the top and a hoof design on the bottom. And after a few years of field practice, the staff was replaced by an all-important drum. These drums incorporate Shaman Ongong, or explained oversimplified, ancestral spirits that are key to a shaman's ability to interact with the spirit world. I've heard it described as, quote, the saddle animal on which the shaman rides, or the mount that carries the invoked spirit to the shaman. Either way, this piece of equipment is absolutely critical to any Mongolian shaman. Now, let's have a look back at the eagle in Ghost of Shima. She forces Jin her, quote, sacred medicine and says, I release your spirit to travel the underworld. Face the judgment of your ancestors. And then Jin promptly passes out, only later to wake up and experience one heck of a mental trip. While Jin says he was poisoned, the eagle states, To open your mind, these visions are just the beginning. Without my help, the fear and pain will overwhelm you. Let me guide you through the horror. Purge the guilt from your spirit. Make you whole again. Just as I have done for all my shaman. This is insanely similar to the Mongol touch of the spirit path that all shaman had faced. It was the responsibility of a high shaman to aid a spirit called individual who was suffering from shaman disease by inducing trances, hallucinations, and the long sleep in order for the spirits to evaluate them. Should the would-be shaman deny the call before and or after the long sleep, their shaman disease would plague their mind more and more until death, exactly like what's happening with Jin. But here's the thing. The eagle, based on everything that I learned and read about Mongol shamanism, is an absolute heretic. I honestly can't imagine what kind of punishment a Mongol shaman would go through if they were caught doing exactly this. Because the eagle is attempting to force her will onto would-be shaman, not assessing shaman who were called by the spirits. Remember, it's a high shaman's job to assist the individual suffering from shaman disease, which was inflicted as a sign from the spirits. The eagle is absolutely not doing that. Instead, she's just simply sidestepping the will of the spirits and trying to forcibly create shaman under her will. This is a demonstrous act of arrogance, which I would imagine would get her executed back home. Ah, so that's why you said bye, Mike. Wait, then is it entirely possible that she's some kind of self-interested individual? Someone unrelated to Kublai Khan's force? You know, I've been thinking about that myself, and yeah, I think it's possible. Because here's the other thing about the eagle. She's got that staff, sure, but I've not seen hide nor hair of a drum, figuratively and literally. And from what I've read, not having a drum means you're not a high shaman, considering how absolutely key it was for shaman rituals. Considering shaman in training possessed a staff for a few years until they became full-fledged shaman, it's theoretically possible that the eagle never made it to her graduation. And perhaps it was radical ideas like this that prevented her from doing it. You know, now I kinda wonder what that sacred medicine stuff tastes like. Probably can't be all that good. True, but you know what tastes amazing? Our sponsor, Boxu. Our sponsor, Bo- <sighs> Alright, look. I know I've been sponsored by these folks for probably the better part of 2021, but if I've learned anything from Boxu, it's that I've learned a lot from Boxu. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the fact that there's 20 to 24 different regional specialty snacks made by families that have been doing this traditionally over a hundred years. That's something you can't really get in stores. But what I love about Boxu has always been the sheer level of cultural inspiration and education that goes into it. I've personally gone through about eh, eight different boxes, and all of them had info and theming from all different holidays, regions, and seasons. Especially seasons. In fact, I'd say that the first box you get when you sign up, Seasons of Japan, is still the best one out of the bunch. It's got the most variety of snacks, first of all, with food theming from seasonal specialties of Japan from spring, summer, winter, and fall, but it also has the biggest concentration of information. A Japanese language section, which since has become a regular with these culture books, but also information on how each season is celebrated, information on cultural hotspots that often get overlooked, and even sections on traditional arts like tea ceremony. I don't usually say this about a lot of sponsors, but even if I wasn't sponsored, I'd still be getting this monthly box because, well, everything I love about Japan is in it. Not just the amazing food, and trust me, these snacks are the absolute tops, but also the metric tons of cultural theming that goes in each box. 
It's like a little bite of a festival or a season in Japan, and considering travel to Japan has been impossible for years now, it's been nice to have a little taste of a place that I love. So if you want to try Boxu for yourself, hit up that link in the description and use the code GAIJIN10 to get 10% off your subscription. Shipping is worldwide, free in the United States, and you can cancel at any time. So come take a literal bite out of Japan's culture. All right, all right, let's get back to Iki Island here. What about the other big part of this DLC story? The Raiders. I mean, let's be real here, they're pirates. One look at how they act, their stronghold, heck, their name. They're the whole reason why Kazuma Sakai, Jin's father, originally went to Iki, who compared the islanders to greedy, vicious, disease-ridden rats. It's assumed that the raiders were, well, raiding the coastline of the mainland, and the Sakai clan presence was there to crush and subjugate the people of Iki back in line to the shogunate system. And boy, howdy did Kazuma take that job with Gusto, earning him the title The Butcher of Iki. But it seems ten years later, the Mongols would give them even bigger trouble. We learn from Tenzo, the second in command of the raiders, that the Mongols had slaughtered the majority of the entire island and were in such dire straits that they were willing to work with a hated samurai, aka Jin, in order to drive the Mongols out. And even after finding out that Jin was the son of the Butcher, they still maintained a solid relationship even after ending the Eagle and liberating Iki. Well, the historical inspiration of the Raiders is actually super easy. They're based on Woko pirates, as the Chinese called them. Wait, Chinese called them? Yeah. See, Woko, translated as dwarf or Japanese pirates, bit of a slang on the Chinese there, targeted not only their home coastline of Japan for loot, but also regularly raided the shores of China and Korea. And with the natural disruption that came with the two nations being invaded by the Mongols in the early 1200s, it became easier and easier for the Woko to sack every coastal town that touched the Sea of Japan to the South China Sea starting in the 1250s. <laughs> I know that didn't last long. I imagine come the armies of the Mongols in 1274, the Woko on Iki and Tsushima would be in massive dire straits, just like they are in-game. Indeed they did, and it was the great slaughter from the Mongols that led to Iki's residents falling into worse poverty and desperation than they already were in, which in turn only fueled even more explosive and deadly raids along the coastline, thus starting the era historians call Early Woko. The raids on Korea and Chinese shores became so bad that in 1367, just as Mongol rule of East Asia was falling apart, Korean envoy Jong Mon Ju formally requested the Bakufu to do something about the Woko. This in turn got Kyushu governor Imigawa Sadayo to make his way to Iki and suppress the entire Woko, at least for a time. Huh, I guess that makes sense in game then. If the Woko were operating as early as the 1250s, they would have established pirate bases by the time the Mongols would arrive in game. Though that also means that the subjugation of the raiders in-game doesn't really have a real-world parallel. Imagawa Sadayo wouldn't suppress the Woko until almost a hundred years later. But this is a fictional retelling, and Sucker Punch may have been inspired by Sadayo's conquests and translated that whole incident into the Sakai clan. Okay, but what about the freaking monkey theme on Iki? Like, the island in-game can feel like it's figuratively and sometimes literally crawling with them. On the broad scale of things, you've got all the different monkey sanctuaries, alongside the Shika Deer and the Yamaneko Leopard Cats, where you guide Jin in pitch changing to play Shakuhachi to lure the animal from the feed, which is always cute. But then there's all these geographical locations. Saru Island, Sarubashi, and Saru Iwa, all together meaning Monkey Island, Monkey Bridge, and Monkey Rock. Then there's Nakajima Island that has all these stone monkey statues big and small tucked away in a few places. Oh, and let's not forget the entire side quest of Black Hand Riku, which rewards you with a perfect Perry spec armor set that is completely tricked out with a raging monkey theme. Finally, when I said that this Iki Island in this game was crawling with monkeys, I kinda meant that. All over the island in pockets are groups of macaques, sometimes isolated, sometimes near human settlements, but always feeling everywhere. Heck, there's even a single onsen spot that serves as the stereotype of Japanese snow monkeys taking a hot dip parallel to humans, Though, truth be told, I'm not sure I'd want to hang out buck naked with a bunch of monkeys in an onsen. So, what the heck gives? Ah, now this one's actually super simple. From what I can tell, the entirety of this mass monkey theme comes from a few geographical locations on IRL Iki. For one, Saru Iwa is an actual, real place. Though, in real life, it's closer to where Hune's refuge is in-game. Also, unlike the game, Saru Iwa on Iki actually looks like a monkey. At least in a profile. But that's just the appetizer of this observation. The main course comes from Ondake Shrine. Despite it being curiously absent from the game, it's this shrine tucked away in the northeastern side of the island that lends so much to Ghost of Tsushima's monkey madness in this DLC. 
Enshrined within is the spirit known as Saruta Hiko no Mikoto, Kami of Guidance. But you notice something interesting going on in that name? Saru Tahiko? Yep, we got wordplay going on. Thus, for usual offerings to Saru Tahiko no Mikoto, stone monkeys are presented and have made their home all over the shrine, with upwards of 230 statues in total, including a lineup of traditional hear, speak, and see no evil monkeys. So while it's not nearly on the same level in-game, Iral Iki Island has plenty of its own places, primarily Primate, and I'm pretty sure that they had a big hand in influencing this DLC. Huh. Makes me wonder what Sucker Punch may do next with the franchise. Personally, I'm hoping for either a sailing mechanic to be added in, or a side adventure on the mainland. Well, whatever may happen in the franchise, I think after four freaking 10 minute plus videos, we've been able to show that the devs certainly don't take this lightly and that they are constantly using history and culture to fuel this wild ride into Japanese history. But either way, thanks for watching everyone! Please, please, please remember that this channel is taking a few weeks break from now until October 1st, but I will be hard at work on Gaijin Perspective videos, streams, and a few D&D Yokai races while I rest my mind for a bit. In the meantime though, if you're still figuratively or literally hungry for more Japanese culture, please be sure to check out Boxu using that link in the description and using the code GAIJIN10 to get 10% off your subscription. And a huge thank you to my patrons who keep my butt afloat in this time of uncertainty. I get a lot of thank yous from a lot of people for doing what I do, but it's these folk who really allow me to do it. So, be sure to check out my other projects while I rest my brain after this 10 year journey of culture and games. And until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.